job, maybe to at certain points, but. Thanks, Angelica. And are, do you have a, a start thing at the bar? Or you just want me to, to get going? You got it, Chris. All right. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone, uh, to Demystifying Observability. That might not have been the title of the presentation that was on the webinar, but uh, I like to make up things as we go along. So we're going to distinguish between myth and reality in today's presentation about application monitoring. Uh, I'm excited to be here with Clean Slate. Also excited to be doing a, a tasting. Uh, I've got my glass, even though I probably won't be, I'll, I'll do all the sniffing, but I won't be doing tasting till after the presentation's done. But um, I look forward to having a real good uh, conversation today and hopefully everyone can learn something about observability and application monitoring. But I'm gonna let Tim talk a little bit first. So Tim, go ahead. Oh, no, before I let Tim go, uh, let's talk about what we're going to do with an agenda. God, I, I usually don't have agenda slide. Uh, we're going to talk about Clean Slate just for a little bit, and then we're going to talk about why observability is important in today's world of IT. And then we're going to turn it over to Sam, who's going to take us through tasting this great whiskey or bourbon or whatever it is. He's going to tell us what that is, too. And then we'll get back into the heart of I know why everyone's here, not the whiskey, but rather uh debunking observability myths and talking about Instana observability, and uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So, Tim, now I'll leave it to you. Just let me know when you want me to switch the screen. No, absolutely. So before I go into uh, any of my slides, and thank you, Chris, uh, for the introduction, um, really excited and really thankful that everyone decided to play hooky for a little bit, uh, quote unquote, on a Thursday afternoon to have a little bit of whiskey and learn about some, some pretty unbelievable technology. Um, if you want to jump to the next slide. So Clean Slate Technology Group, we are uh, an IBM uh, Platinum business partner based out of the Crossroads of America, Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, where we have been a platinum reseller of IBM solutions for 23 years. Uh, we also have uh, a uh, software asset management practice as part of this as well, which we've been doing for 12 years. Uh, out of those uh, five individuals at the bottom of the screen is part of that make up our sales team. Three of them have been doing this for 15 plus years. So we have a wealth of knowledge around all things IBM, including this emerging technology uh, surrounding observability. Uh, that is just one part of our, uh, of our business. Uh, Chris, if you jump to the next slide. Uh, this goes hand in hand with what we're talking about today, the importance of observability, uh, is our cloud consulting side of our business as well. We are uh, an AWS advanced and uh, Azure cloud consulting partner. Uh, well, we bring our wealth of knowledge and expertise into four core focus areas. As you can see, cloud native SaaS development strategy and implementation. Uh, our team can help you do this and do this absolutely perfectly. DevOps strategy and implementation, which plays in perfectly with observability and knowing exactly how your applications will ultimately be performing. Uh, cloud architecture strategy and implementation. People are investing a lot of money into these cloud infrastructures. You want to make sure that you have the right path forward, and we have the ability to do that. And then lastly, but certainly not least, is a data, data analytics uh, side of our house as well, which is only growing uh, with the emergence of some newer technologies that are leveraging some really cool things that data can do. Uh, something that we bring to the table uh, on our cloud consulting side is you tell us what you believe your path forward would be. We run some diagnostics and we ultimately help you achieve your goals, uh, hopefully in a, in a quicker time frame than you anticipate. Doesn't matter how complex or how challenging a thing could be. We have some pretty smart individuals uh, on our technical team that are willing to step up and help. So uh, Chris, I will pass it back over to you. But before I do, uh, we want this to be, you know, somewhat interactive. Obviously, um, you know, we have a chat available. Throw any questions that you might have in. If we can answer them in real time, that'd be fantastic. Otherwise, we will have a portion at the end to hopefully cover everything uh, that you guys are curious about. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Nice, Tim. Thanks. Okay, so why observability? I want to take you through a little bit of why observability has become a thing today versus just the next version of APM. And the primary reason for this is that across the board, both large and small businesses, transformation or specifically digital transformation is accelerating. Now, I have a little bit of trivia here. You'll, you'll wow them at your next pub trivia one. 
the term digital transformation was first used in 1943. I don't think they were doing the same digital transformation that we're doing today. But I, I just, I love to throw that nugget out there. But today what we're doing is trying to accelerate our paths to market. We're trying to become better performing IT organizations. We're trying to get all of our processes into applications and we're trying to make those applications work better. Now, I love this chart from McKinsey because while we know that during the pandemic, digital transformation went sky high, actually the ramp up had started before the pandemic. And so what you have here is McKinsey says it's 10 years of digitization and under one year will actually the growth accelerated. And what, what that ends up doing or what's driving that is the fact that in today's world, it's no longer large companies or large fish that eat the small fish or small companies, but rather the quicker fish that eat the slower fish. And in business, that's absolutely true. It's companies that can react to the marketplace. It's companies that can react to specific user needs in their applications that are going to win in the business world. So they want to be more responsive to users. You want to accelerate your pipelines. Uh, I have a little saying that um, in today's world, not everyone can be continuous delivery in the continuous delivery part of CICD, but everybody should be trying to get to continuous delivery because the faster you can go and the more frequently you can update your software, the better your applications are going to perform, the higher your, your customers are going to be happy with you. Um, so as uh, I always like to say as a, uh, the late Al Davis, the owner of the now Las Vegas Raiders, used to say speed kills. It's true in football. It's definitely true in business. So how are these things being driven in the application world? Well, the real thing is this idea of the rise of the cloud native infrastructure, microservices, cloud system, Kubernetes, et cetera. So what does that look like and why does that matter? Well, if you think about the world of microservices, here's some uh, screenshots of some Instana web pages. And what these web pages are, are the just some of the 300 plus technologies that we monitor. Compare that to what you monitor with APM, Java. Okay, .NET. Okay, Ruby too. But, and, and other languages. But you can see there's a vast difference in the way that you think about observability versus APM in a microservices world. The run times, those languages. That's not the crux of things anymore. There's this big world out there that you have to be able to monitor. Then you have the hyper-virtualization on top of it, starting with containers, not just Docker, but Cryo and Alexi, others. And then you have orchestration through Kubernetes, but all the different distributions of Kubernetes and even pre-Kubernetes, things like um, Omnisphere or D2IQ now. And you have serverless in there. Uh, there's serverless functions on every cloud provider now. So all these things are creating an environment that is more dynamic, more ephemeral, harder to understand. And what does it mean when I say more complex? Now, the what really gets lost here is an APM tool can see inside a runtime. So when you have a three-tiered architecture and you can see inside that app server, that means you see everything because everything touches the app server. But microservices environments, that's no longer the case. Now I have here a few simple applications and they are simple, they're web scale, but they're just connecting databases and users together, right? And you can see the complexity in here. Uh, I, I think that, I, I think it's the Twitter uh, architecture is affectionately called the Death Star architecture, but these are way too complex for an individual or an, even an organization of individuals to understand. So you have to start thinking about how does the tooling understand the complexity that's built in and how does it deal with changes? Because when you start to take change into account, you start to lose visibility in a certain thing. And that takes us all the way back to the original rule of APM and application monitoring, which is you can't fix what you can't see. And if you think about how all this stuff changes and how complex it is, it's enough to drive you to drink. And that's where we're going right now. So I'm going to pass it over to Sam, take a break from talking about techie stuff and let him take us through um, this wonderful whiskey tasting. Well, thanks, Chris. I'm glad you went through some of the complexities there before we got into the drinking and uh, make sure everyone's mind is still sharp. 
Um, hopefully we don't uh, interfere too much with the rest of your presentation, but um, really appreciate everybody having me and, and great to meet everybody here on the call. Um, Chris and the team reached out and thought it would be cool to include a whiskey tasting within the presentation today. So uh, here I am with uh, our brand that's based out of San Francisco, California called Gold Bar Whiskey. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So um, we are, I'm not sure where everybody's calling in from um, across the country or, or what states everybody's in right now or cities, but uh, we're based out of San Francisco. So we're an award-winning whiskey distillery there. Uh, we create a couple of different whiskeys and a few different bourbons um, on Treasure Island. If anyone's familiar with that, it's a small little island um, that was originally built in the 1930s for the World's Fair, um, the Golden Gate Exposition and still exists today. It's halfway between San Francisco and Oakland. Um, it's a man-made island and that's where you find uh, our distillery and our, our newly open tasting room as well. Um, before I go into the whiskeys and bourbons themselves, um, this is our master blender. So his name's uh, Montgomery Paulson. He's a second generation winemaker. Um, so his father, Pat Paulson, owns a few wineries up in Napa Valley. So that's where his expertise really came from. Um, he spent his school time at UC Berkeley um, in many years in, in the wine industry before flipping over to whiskey. And what's unique and interesting um, that kind of sets our whiskeys and our bourbons apart is the secondary aging process or the casking that happens where you're aging the whiskey in a barrel. The second barrel that we age all of our whiskeys in are former red wine barrels from Napa Valley. So that really helps smooth out the product, add a little bit of sweetness and gives it a distinct flavor that you might not find in some other products. So um, these are some of the whiskeys that we have. I believe everybody has the black bottle there, second from the left, uh, but these are some of our core products here. So um, I have a few of them, I don't know if you can see, pretty unique in terms of the packaging. It's kind of hard with my background here, but um, our gold bar, our original product is what we started out with. Um, it's a very smooth, easy drinking and approachable whiskey. We have our black, um, which is a double cask bourbon. Um, so you're going to get a little bit stronger and a little bit more smoke um, as you go down the line here. We have our Rick House um, cask strength bourbon. So this is 103 proof bourbon. Um, comes right out of the bare bottle. So it's not diluted and proofed down at all. Um, so it's a little bit stronger, but, um, you know, from what we've heard and, and what we're trying to do is continue to, to maintain that smoothness and that easy drinking across all of our products. Um, and one interesting thing that, uh, I have here as well that we don't have in the presentation, but, um, this is our newest product that kind of hard to see here. Um, let me turn off my, uh, background for a second if I can. Um, but this is a new collaboration we just did with Joe Montana. So. Um, we've got a special edition bottle here uh, with the 40, 49ers and Joe Montana um, that we've created a new whiskey with Joe uh, over the past couple of months, which is a cognac barrel finished whiskey. So something fun that we just did in terms of a kind of celebrity collaboration there. Okay, awesome. I'm seeing some, uh, some locations pop up here in the chat, Atlanta, Dallas. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, so what we're going to be tasting today is um, our black double cast bourbon. Um, so if everybody wants to go ahead and, and pour a little bit, if you have it on hand, I got my glass here as well. Um, you know, you can drink this neat. Um, sometimes I like to throw a little ice cube in there. It's all kind of personal preference. Um, you know, this bourbon also goes really well in some cocktails. Um, we make a really good Manhattan with this. You can make a great old fashioned. Um, there's tons of different recipes. If you have a bottle, um, which I think most of you do, goldbarwhiskey.com. We have a full recipes page if you want to experiment a little bit more um, this weekend if you're liking what you're drinking. So um, yeah, I mean, you guys can go ahead and, and take a little smell and take a, take a sip and see what you think. But um, this is a, a double cast bourbon. So um, what that means is it's going into two different types of barrels. Um, what makes a bourbon typically, there's kind of a few different criteria. The two main ones being um, the grain mash is over 51% corn. So over half of it is corn. You can see here our mash bill, 20% corn, or sorry, 80% corn and 20% rye. And the second thing um, that makes a bourbon, it has, it has to spend time 
um, in a charred new American oak barrel. So you can see here first, um, the bourbon goes into new American oak. Um, it's an extra charred barrel. So what that means is we take a, a, a torch and a hot flame and you char the inside of the barrel. So that way, when the whiskey sits in it, it picks up a lot of that smoke that you're tasting, a lot of that barrel taste um, that you get comes from that extra charred barrel. After that, um, it goes into our French oak and that's the wine barrel. So we source mostly um, Merlot and, and Cabernet barrels that were formerly used for wine in Napa Valley. So it spends about three to six years, depending um, in the first barrel, which is new American oak. This is a Texas bourbon. And then it gets um, transferred over into our um, French oak wine barrels before being bottled and sold. So um, yeah, any, any any feedback? Anybody like what they're tasting or, or have any uh, specific thoughts about the taste or smell? I can't resist. I'm going to have a sip. You've got to. How long can you use the wine barrels? That's a good question. Um, typically, they spend about six months after the first aging process in the wine barrel. Um, I think that goes through a couple different cycles um, before those, you know, soaked up the majority of the flavor that you're going to get from that. And we transfer on to the new wine barrels. Um, yeah, so uh, award-winning whiskey, um, all of our whiskeys, we've won um, the double gold at San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It's an exciting accomplishment for us because what that means is there's 26 judges and they blind taste test um, a bunch of different products. And in order to win double gold, all 26 to unanimously um, decide that it's a gold medal winner. So uh, we're very happy with that award. It kind of puts some validation towards our products and, and we're happy to, you know, um, announce that we've won those across the board for all of our products. Uh, a Texas whiskey, pretty simple. It's made in Texas. Um, it's kind of a weird thing with, uh, with bourbons and whiskeys. You know, you can relate it to a champagne where in order to be officially a champagne, it has to come from that region. Um, it's kind of the same thing with, with whiskeys and bourbons and scotch, um, you know, a lot of what classifies it as that type of spirit is simply because where it's coming from geographically. So you can see here um, a couple of the tasting notes. Um, you know, you get a lot of that smoke. Um, I definitely get a little bit of that, you know, uh, creaminess and, and, and butteriness from the bourbon um, as you sip on it and uh, taste some of that caramel and vanilla in there as well. I'm Sam, I don't know about everyone else, but like, okay, like okay. for me, it's same as when I'm at a winery <laughs> and they tell me what it smells like. And then I smell it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it does smell like that. Exactly. Uh, so I really appreciate the tasting notes. No, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that I don't know if there's any other slides here. I think just uh, your contact information. Yeah, this is I mean, this is our newly opened um, tasting room that we just opened on Treasure Island. Um, it's pretty cool because it's actually in the old Pan Am airport that was built in 1939. So it's one of the only three remaining buildings from the 30s on Treasure Island that still stand today. Everything else was uh, was torn down um, during World War II and it was used as a naval base. Um, but this building remains. So this is where people would go in the 1930s and 40s and check in for their flight from San Francisco to Hong Kong. Um, it was a five-day flight at the time, so it stopped over in Hawaii, Guam, Manila, um, before reaching Hong Kong, and it was $5,000 um, for a ticket in 1939, which is about $100,000 in, in today's currency uh, with inflation considered. So um, it was a very, um, you know, white tablecloth, uh, ultimate first-class experience for those first and early travelers uh, going across to Asia, and we were trying to bring back some of this luxury um and we've modeled our distillery and our tasting room here after uh, a 1930s jazz bar um to kind of bring back that vibe um of that luxurious travel this is uh here sitting at the bar on your left is joe montana um hall of fame super bowl winning quarterback for the 49ers and on the right is monty who i just talked about who's our our master distiller so enjoying a glass of whiskey and talking about how it's made and that's the beautiful view you get right outside of our window of the uh, the downtown skyline in San Francisco. So um, 
you know, the Clean Slate team has my my contact information, and I encourage anybody if they're ever out in San Francisco visiting, please do come come by and see us. We do uh, some awesome experiences, and you'll have the chance to taste some of our other whiskeys and bourbons as well. Thanks, Sam. Definitely going to be a stop on any of my San Francisco trips from now on. Please make it happen. We'd love to have you. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, now we got to get back to what everyone really wants, which is to talk about observability. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Love, love the, uh, love the whiskey. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about observability myths. Makes sense. We're drinking here. Let's talk about things that don't exist and aren't true. Uh, so let's talk about Stan's six myths of observability. And I'm just going to lay them out to start, and then we'll talk about each one a little bit. First myth: observability is just the next version of APM. That sounds interesting. Don't bother monitoring. Just write everything in the logs. Observability has to be expensive. Myth number four, it's just for SREs or site reliability engineers. Myth number five, observability is, the on, is only useful on massive, large applications. Number six, you can build it yourself. Uh, so these are the really myths of observability. Let's talk a little bit about observability in general. Again, we'll go right back to Remembering why observability from the technical sphere. Remember, we talked about cloud native environments and containers, orchestration, microservices. Uh, we didn't talk about multi-cloud crossing different private and public clouds, but today's workloads really do do that. And how you can see as it transitions from one to other is important. And then we talked about the beautiful magic of serverless and being able to monitor it in production as well. But there's also process changes that are occurring that make observability necessary. Now, whether you think of this as a DevOps process or a continuous delivery process, this is essentially how people are operating software pipelines today. And one of the things that happens is there's lots of ways to automate each of these steps, except the last one, where there isn't a lot of automation there. There's some, but in reality, what's happening is a lot of people are speeding up their pipelines only to be caught by their monitoring not being automated. And it doesn't stop it here. It actually stops it back here because everyone gets ready to release and they're like, wait, we have to reconfigure monitoring. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But this is the process aspect of why observability has come into play as a, a tool that's needed. And let's talk a little bit about the IT war room that's dealing with those SEV1 or SEV0 problems, however you categorize them, P1, Prime A, right? Before APM, it was actually the blame game was the way that IT war rooms worked. Everyone pointed to everyone else. It's the network. No, it's the servers. No, it's the code. Where are the developers? They're, they're, this is an old IBM commercial. They're out snowboarding. Uh, the blame game was the rule of the day. And then APM came along and it, provided a way for everyone to work together because it provided a common ground that kind of brought everything together from the perspective of the application and allowed the team to work as a whole to solve problems. Or as I like to say with APM, the war room became collaborative. But I'm going to say that we shouldn't collaborate anymore. And I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek. I'm not saying that, that collaboration is bad, but when you're talking about always trying to collaborate to solve problems, that can be a problem. And let me explain why. If we think of our, our little, nice little royalty-free marketing picture I picked up here, it's got 12 people in a meeting. I've counted them. You don't have to. You can if you want, but there's 12 people in this meeting. One of them has to take the task after this meeting is done to go fix the thing that caused the problem. Now, they're all clapping because they finally figured it out. But, uh, I'm going to tell you that 92% of these people are wasting their time. That's right. 11 of the 12 of them are wasting their time in this meeting because with observability, you no longer have to have all 12 people in a room to figure out that it's Susie's problem or Dan's problem or Chris's problem. With observability, Susie and Dan see that their stuff is okay and Chris is getting notification I'm getting a notification that I've got to go fix my problem. So that's the difference between observability and APM. Observability delivers an understanding of how things work together that helps deliver the starting point of fixing the problem as opposed to just trying to 
figure out where it is as a team using a lot of good data that's an APM, but it doesn't provide understanding, it's just data. So observability is APM, but it is so much more. So it's not just the next name for APM, it actually goes well beyond all the concepts and the ideas of APM to do so much more. So let's talk about number two. Don't bother monitoring, just write everything to logs. And I have a message for that. That's a terrible idea. It is a terrible idea. Oh, now it's gonna try to play. Uh, so why is it a terrible idea? If you Because you can write everything to logs and that's great for debugging problems, but how do you know when you actually have a problem to debug? Well, of course, we can wait for the, a ticket to be written, or we can wait for the support line to start getting calls from our users, or we can just wait for checkout to slow down to a crawl, and then the business side will write a ticket and go, how come we don't have checkouts happening at the rate we're supposed to? I think we all get that monitoring is actually a really important part of delivering high-value, high-performance applications. Observe, all right, I, I went too fast. Observability, myth three, observability has to be expensive. And there's some truth, of course, in all these, just like observability is APM, but it's so much more. And you could not bother monitoring and write everything to logs, but that would be a terrible idea. And observability can be expensive, but it doesn't have to be expensive. And I'm just gonna say, you know, that what's happening out there is that all the old APM vendors, they have pricing based on gathering lots of revenue from tiny little footprints. But in the observability world, the footprints have grown. We saw all those different microservices. And in that realm, you start charging a different way. And what's happened is every single APM vendor, or now every single observability vendor, has a different way of pricing. And I'm sure you've all heard the stories out there of the uh, um, cryptocurrency uh, business that had a very large surprise quarterly charge. It was more than $50 million. That's what can happen when you start looking at these different pricing models and you start to ramp up some of the things that you have to do. They're charging based on log ingestion. They're charging based on storage. They're charging based on the amount of traces you take. They're charging based on the number of users you have. One of them traces based on, uh, one of them charges based on having your users doing debugging. Uh, excuse me, that's the point of the tool is to debug. So you're actually charging for users. You're just trying to hide it that you're actually charging for users. So it can be expensive, but it doesn't have to be. And uh, hint, hint, Instana has a simple, transparent, fair pricing uh, that is designed to give no surprise charges and also doesn't nickel and dime by including all the functionality that you can think of that's part of Instana comes with that single price. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the platform. And if you're familiar with observability at all, you've thought about the words metrics, traces, and logs, because that's what makes up observability. And that is true. It does. But what I want to talk about today is not what's an observability, but how you go about getting that observability. And we like to think in terms of automation, context, and intelligent actions. And when you put these together as the way that you deal with metrics, traces, and logs, you create an observability platform that can be used from teams of one or two people all the way up to massive, large enterprise environments and large cross-organizational users. So what makes Instana different? The, the real crux of Instana, it starts with our data fidelity. We have one second granularity on 99 point something percent of any metrics that we take. And there are a few that we have that we have to slow down to 15 or 30 just because of the way that a metric is. But we default all of our metrics to one second granularity. What does that mean? It means you'll never miss any problem, no matter how small it is. When you have longer granularity, if you have a few users that have problems, depending on the number, the, the, the volume of your transactions or the volume of your application, you might not even see a bump, let alone a spike. You, you just see a smooth line. So we want to get rid of that smooth line and show you everything that possibly can. One second granularity. 
The other half of data fidelity is taking a trace of every request all the time, full end to end, no sampling. We don't take pieces of it and we take every single one and we have it there so that you now you know whenever you have a problem and you have all the data that you need to go solve it right away. We talked about the transparent predictable pricing and big part of Instana is about automated continuous discovery. You're going to see some screens in a few minutes and you're going to go, wow, that's cool. And when we get there, I'll talk a little bit about continuous discovery, but this is what I'm talking about when we think about those large, weird Death Star architectures and how you can possibly understand what's going on with them. You can't, but the observability tool, well, Instana can understand it for you. Um, we're considered the analyst leader for modern technology stacks, cloud native, et cetera. If you look at G2 Crowd, and I finally remember the first week we sent out the emails asking people to put in uh, reviews on G2 Crowd years ago. We went from not being on the G2 Crowd grid to being right in there with the leaders literally weeks into our campaign. If you look at, at the G2 grid today, we are by far right and up from even the best, oldest, most established tool vendors that are out there. It's in Stana all alone at the top of the G2 grid. And that's the customers talking. And then we talk about an intuitive user interface. The important part of that is because we don't require want to require training just to learn how to use the product. Because when you roll it out, we want everyone to be able to use it. Not just your IT ops team, but also developers. So let's talk about automating full stack visibility. Automatic continuous discovery. Now you hear, see here a very pretty, this was designed by gamers actually, our UX was designed by gamers. And it's a really nice, pretty view of infrastructure. And it will populate automatically. It, all you do is drop in and sauna at the host level and we'll discover all the things you see here. And we even automate the groupings based on how the, what the machines are and how they've been tagged. We actually read all that and we'll group it accordingly. But what makes it valuable is tomorrow when 26 changes occur, you don't have to inform Instana. Instana will pick it up automatically. It'll change the map as needed and you can even go back and replay it. So this means you always have accurate data. You always have accurate maps. And you'll notice here that we, we popped up, we clicked on one of the hosts and it gave you a list of all the things that are running on the host. You just click on whatever you want to click from that list and you go over to the dashboard of, for whatever that thing is. So that's automated full stack visibility. Next, context, collecting accurate data in context. We build based on a graph theory. So graph means everything tied together, linked together programmatically. We're talking about uh, how infrastructure pieces work together. Infrastructure pieces tied to application, what the stack looks like what services call other services or interdependencies, the configuration of different platforms and services and how the users actually interact with them. This is all captured in the dynamic graph. Um, that allows us to drive automated anomaly detection. Now we're gonna jump back to automation. You never actually have to set alert thresholds with us. You can if you want, but unlike APM tools of the past, you never, ever have to say, well, to get an alert that something's going on, I have to go set my warning threshold and alert. Thresh no, no, no. We're just going to let you know when things start to go wrong. Um, we have a thing called application perspectives. It's probably one of the most powerful tools of our product. And it allows you to filter the things that only you care about. But here's the kicker. Let's say there are a thousand things out there and I'm responsible for five. So I create an application perspective for my five. And here's the cool thing. I don't really have to mainly do anything because I've tagged all my code with CF. So I create an application perspective looking for code with CF. Now here's the cool thing. Out of the thousand, it's not gonna filter down to the five. It's actually gonna filter both upstream and downstream of everything that touches the five. So it's, and it'll carry it as I go all the way through my tools, as I look at infrastructure, as I look at different dashboards, as I look in the analytics system, as I look at traces, it's only stuff that goes through the things I'm responsible for. Thus, I can focus in on what's important to me. This was a request from our biggest 
number of user customers because they said their developers love the product, but they really need to filter out the noise. So this allows you to filter out the noise and it can be applied not just on code tags, they could be applied on things like the login transactions or checkout requests or premium users. Anything that you want, you can set this view and now you have this filtered view. So it makes it more useful for everyone. And this all drives our wonderful service maps. So you can see that there are dependencies on here. You can also see that you've got a data flow happening in the diagram. This is actual screenshot of real product. And it gives you an idea of where the data is going and how. And it, of course, it's interactive. So if, if a service were to get in an anomaly situation, you'd see it go yellow. If it were to get into a service problem, you'd see it go red. And if you click on any one, it'll show you everything upstream and downstream. So this is all tied together to give you that full context. And why are you using it for? To create intelligent actions. Not just you though, by the way. Also, the tool itself. Because we have AI, specifically some machine learning built in that allows us to do things like correlate every single piece of data that comes in on the data stream. We have our metrics that we're gathering. We have our traces that we're gathering. We get log information from the application logs, the service logs. And also we support all the open source APIs out there. So let's say that your developers are writing something in Prometheus. We're bringing that in too. It's part of our data stream. Let's say that you've got some open telemetry going. We're bringing that in too. It's part of the stream. And we correlate it all together. And when a service incident occurs, remember that meeting of 12 people. This is where we go. Hey, you got a service incident, by the way. It's on Chris's piece of Java code right here, right? Now, I, I get that and everyone else does too. So those other 11 people, they don't have to worry about anything. It, some people refer to it as mean time to innocence. With Instana, mean time to innocence practically goes to zero. And instead, I get notified, I got to go fix my problem. I can go fix it. So I've got guided troubleshooting here. We also have this thing called the Instana Action Framework that allows you to automate remediation for things that you can do, that you have run books for, that you know how to deal with, like spinning up new containers or taking a server down and bringing it back up. And then we have finally the piece of intelligent action is a, a tooling that we call Unbounded Analytics. It's essentially a massive analysis engine that you can customize and put filters on and put queries on without having to write a query language. You actually can manually manipulate things and then save a search or save the, the query. And then you can spread it around to any of the users that need to use it. So um, obviously with this kind of power, Instana isn't just for SREs. Instana can't and be, is for everybody. And democratizing data is how you get everyone more efficient. And we're gonna talk about efficiency in a few minutes. Uh, MINTS 5, it's only useful on massive applications. The reality is, is because of our simple pricing, because of the automation, because you don't have to configure anything, Instana can be used on all your applications. Um, and as I always like to say, every application is important to somebody. So there's a group of people out there. It might only be two or three, and maybe one application owner and one IT ops person, but they care about that application. And man, the fact that Instana can come on automatically get running, going, and show the two of them anything that's happening, even without them having to know how it's architected or built, that's extremely valuable. And that's why we say it's useful for all applications and all users. And the last myth, you can build it yourself. The truth is you can go build observability yourself with things like Prometheus and Jaeger and OpenTelemetry and open source dashboarding tools. But you really shouldn't. And the reason that you really shouldn't is because if you think about all the things that go around what you do with the data, that's where just instrumenting your code becomes a problem. Now, we fully support all of those APIs I just mentioned, plus more, and bringing them into the Instana data set and running all of our analysis on them. We don't care where your data comes from, but that's instrumenting having your developers instrument their code with uh, a piece of prometheus or open telemetry to get some bit of information out that's not the same as building your own observability tool right so let us handle the analytics for you let us deal with the understanding of how things work together you just go on doing the things that you need to do and this way your developers 
can focus on the things that are important to them, which is to innovate. All right. So I'm going to pause for a second before I summarize. Do we have any questions, Angelica, from the chat? I'm going to go go look real quick. Yeah, nothing that's okay. come up yet. More just okay. chit chat right. back and forth. Yeah. No worries. Uh, okay. So what is Instana really? It's one tool for all your applications. We have digital experience management, which you might, which you expect from any observability tool, but we have that from a website's perspective and browsers. We also do mobiles. We are also the first, and as far as I know, still the only APM observability tool ever to build a native agent to work inside the mainframe. So you've got all these old legacy, really powerful backend systems and your APM tools, remember they were in that, they were in the runtime. So they could tell you, hey, we've got a problem working with that kick system or that IMS system. But they didn't show you what was going on in that system. They just said, hey, there's going something going on. And then IBM made a plug in, it's APM, and everybody has access to it. But we actually built native Instana agents to go monitor exactly what those application components are doing, what those backend systems are doing from the perspective of the application. So that's why we call it mobile to mainframe. We talked about G2 Crowd already. We talked about fully automated monitoring. That's from setup all the way through root cause analysis with change detection, an important part of it, and the ability to address all the stakeholders of applications. Proven value. Obviously, with the G2 Crowd, we have lots of proven customers getting being very happy with what it, what it does. But what does it do for them? It decreases their number of service incidents. Remember that one second granularity? That means that a developer can see very small, minute details that are not even a SEV2 or SEV3 problem, but they can go fix it before it becomes a SEV2, SEV3, or especially a SEV1 incident. Um, even with that, what we see is development teams, because they're not required to set up a configure monitoring, because they're not required to go to that war room with all those people in it, they get back a bunch of time. 20%, 30%, a few customers have gotten back 50%. And we talked about that war room a little bit. And I, I use my example of 12, but think think of some of your war rooms. I've had customers that have had over 150 people come to a two hour meeting for every sub one problem. So, so that's 300 hours just getting together to understand what's going on. If you have one a month, that's two person years. If you have one a week, you're talking about eight person year, you're wasting eight people's of worth of time getting everyone together when you could just have a tool that delivers the understanding and gets it out. And then because you're correctly getting rid of all your incidents, your problems, you no longer have reactionary things where you're extra provisioning servers, where you're running out of threads and just rolling out a new server because you, you can't figure out what the problem is. Over time, as Instana makes your application work better, you're going to start, you're going to start saving money just because you don't have to provision anymore. And here's some bonus things. Instana creates better teams. Of course, everyone, co everyone I, we say stop collaborating, but everyone has a nice collaborative view of the world. We have increased deployment frequency, which is a key measurement of a high-performance IT organization, and you get quicker time to market. And here's a bonus from that we found out from our customers. When you give observability to your developers, the morale of your development team goes way up. So it makes everyone happier all around. Um, finally, summarization of what we... Summer, summation, summarization of what we, I swear I only had one sip. I didn't do any more. Um, we have automation, real-time context and intelligent action as driving all this thing. And what do we mean by automate? We mean everything in a monitoring life cycle. What do we mean by context? Understanding how everything interacts with everything else. And for intelligent actions, we mean not just the tool, but also your teams getting better at things. So one last slide and then I'll hand it over to Angelica to finish up. Um, we talked about real user value, reducing the time it takes to repair by 52%, reducing the time it takes to detect by 70% or more. These are just some examples. Um, increasing deployment frequency by 300% or more, getting more efficient with your cloud, cutting your cloud spin because you're not having to deal with problems as much, 
And then the massive savings in time and effort of all your teams, not just operations, but also development, the business side, et cetera. Okay. Thank you for taking time to listen to me today to talk about Instana and the missive observability. Uh, Angelica, what else do you got? Yes. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. I learned a lot of things myself. I think the value slide specifically has some great information that we can distribute after this to everyone on the call as well. Um, and hopefully everyone took away something new, even if it was about the whiskey, even if, just a little <laughs> something. <laughs> I'm sure they took away a lot more. Uh, but before we, we already have some questions in the chat and we'll get to those right now. We just wanted to share our contact information right here. If you want to take a screenshot, uh, Tim and I have also been in touch with some of you on this call already. Um, and we'll also follow up with our information. I also am going to put a link in the chat to a 14 day free trial for you uh, to kind of see the value of Insana yourself. And we can also walk you through that trial. If you'd be interested in that, we can also do a deeper dive, a kind of deeper conversation, um, just like what we've had today with you or do a personalized demo. So we'll follow up with all of this information and, you know, feel free to reach out with any questions. And another thing I wanted to add that may be relevant to some of you uh, on this call. So IBM and AWS, I'm sure some of you have heard, signed a strategic partnership this past year where IBM is moving a lot of their portfolio into the AWS marketplace. So if anyone here is using AWS already for your applications or your data, um, there's an opportunity there for you to acquire IBM technologies like Instana in the AWS marketplace, utilizing your current cloud spend that you have. And let me put that link in the chat now so you all have it, um, if it lets me. Yep, okay, I think that's there. Okay, and the yep. next slide is more just, okay, perfect. That is good. Just to open the floor to more questions. And Chris, there's a couple here in the chat. I can read these to you. That'd be great. So there's one here from Brandon. It says, Chris, you hit on it a little before, but there are other APM slash observability tools on the market. What makes Instana better than those competitors and why should customers look at Instana? Great first question. <laughs> a very loaded question. Um, so whenever I talk about other tools uh, in the marketplace, I always like to say this, and I, we didn't talk about it, but I've been doing APM for more than 20 years, which is a scary statement to make. Um, and at the time that companies bought their APM tool, it was a great decision. You had applications running on uh, WebSphere or .NET or WebLogic or JBoss, and you were trying to make them work better and be able to understand what's going on in production because there was no visibility. An APM tool was a great tool to have there. And then platforms changed and you needed the next generation of APM tools. And so people migrated to version two of APM. And that was a great decision. And then along came cloud native and containers and containers were the quickest accepted and rolled out large enterprise change in the platform, even quicker than Java did. And all of a sudden, all those APM tools, they struggled. Now they've gotten better. They're not all perfect yet. Some are better than others. But it was time to make another great decision. And that great decision is go with observability. And what makes Instana different is because we are built with not just me that have been at other APM companies, but the founders had been not at one, not necessarily just at one, but at multiple APM companies. And then the people they got in to run products and development and marketing. We had all worked at multiple APM companies. We knew what we wanted to bring and we knew what we wanted to fix. And so I think of Instana as kind of like, not even just the next generation, but the next next generation of tooling for application monitoring. It starts with the one second granularity. Nobody's even close. Like the, even after rewriting all of their tooling, the best tools got to 10 seconds. But even with 10 seconds granularity, they can't let you know that problems are occurring right away. With one second granularity, let's say you release a new piece of code, 
we actually tell you in three seconds if that code needs to be rolled back. So if you wait, if you have to wait 10 seconds before you get your first measurement, and then the tooling waits until it gets a minute of measurements before it decides whether to send an alert, you're you're in bad shape. So it's about speed, it's about reaction and understanding. And that's the other big difference is that because of the way that the context is built together and because of the way that it's easy to use, we have companies that were using APM happily with 12 or 13 APM users that during the trial of Instana had 300 or 400 users. And now they have over a thousand users using the product every day because everyone uses it as part of their regular job now. Those are the biggest differences. The other things that are there, we, we talked about some of those, there's, there's pricing, pricing model differences. There's the way the data is analyzed. You have the analytics aspect, you have application perspectives, all those are cool little features. But at the end of the day, it's seeing everything you need to see so that you can find and fix problems even quicker than before. Okay, thank you, Chris. And the next question here from Dan says, Chris, can you talk a bit about how Instana integrates with OpenShift and Kubernetes? Absolutely. So uh, Instana was actually the first tool to not only monitor applications running on Kubernetes, but to also be able to monitor Kubernetes itself. And right out of the gate, we knew that it was important not just to support Kubernetes as an entity, but to be able to support all the different distributions of Kubernetes that are out there, including OpenShift. So we have specific sensors built for Kubernetes, but we also have them built to monitor AKS and GKE and GKE on-prem. So Amazon or Azure Kubernetes, IBM's Kubernetes service or OpenShift, right? Um, and even within OpenShift, we actually supported Tectonic. We support VMware's Kubernetes and we support open source Kubernetes. So we don't care what kind it is. We want to be able to monitor Kubernetes as a system. And in fact, it's a first class citizen in our monitoring screens. We have a, there's a link at the top menu, uh, show me my Kubernetes. Um, and one of the cool things about Instana is that everything is connected to everything else, not just in our graph, but also within the UX itself. So if I'm in Kubernetes and I want to look at a, at a, at a runtime running inside it, I just click over and now I'm looking at my piece of Java code. And if I want to look at something on the back end of that, I can look at the flow and go, oh, there's a database that I'm dependent on. I'm going to go jump to that. And I'm just clicking. I'm just going right through every time. So this is part of not just the way that we monitor Kubernetes, but the way we monitor everything. Okay, our next question here. And Dan, was that, did that answer your question? Is that... For the most part, yeah. yeah, thanks. Okay, great. So you have Art who asked, what is the best way to get management support for getting an Instana demo? What if anything would you like for us to consider and helping AWS clients consider Instana as a way to save money and use their cloud spend. So Instana does count. It is in the marketplace. So they can use, they can, you can buy Instana and utilize, use up your cloud spend through the marketplace. It is there. Um, the best way to get management support for an Instana demo. Um, the things that are out there that, might mean that you need to take a look at a new tool or something else is um, one, are you getting, are you still getting surprised by a lot of sub two and sub one outages? Are you, are your, are your teams, both development and operations, not able to proactively just deal with the small incidents that are occurring and not have them become large service incidents. A second thing that might be there is if everyone feels a little overwhelmed with data. Um, because we have, you know, we have the filters built in, but even before that, a lot of organizations have resorted to that logging aspect and they're essentially just have operators, massive numbers of operators, massive could be five or it could be 50, right? Just spending their day, just watching log screens go by, looking for that red alert or an orange alert. So if they're feeling a little overwhelmed, uh, another thing that can happen is, are, would they like to make a technology decision on your platforms 
but they're not really sure they can monitor it. That's a great time to bring in Stana. The last one is, is are they slowing down their pipelines because monitoring can't keep up? Or they're slowing it down because monitoring, they'd be releasing with a gap in visibility. These are the big things that mo that management would be aware of that you could say, hey, there's a tool for that. And the way I always look at it is, look, the monitoring tools that are out there are able to do what they do. And you're dealing with these pains and they've been around for dec or over a decade. So everyone's like, yeah, this is just the, this is just how it is with the application monitoring tools. It doesn't have to be that way. And when you fix them, the efficiency numbers are through the roof. Perfect. Yeah. Seems like we've gotten through all the questions and we're at the end of the hour. <clears throat> um, so if anyone, yeah, we made it through. So if anyone has more questions, feel free to reach out to Tim or myself, uh, Chris as well. We can, we can answer any outstanding questions you have. And, you know, again, the link to the trial is in the chat but it will send it via email as well. Um, and yeah, well, anything else that you'd like to add, Chris or Tim? Uh, I just like to say thanks for coming, everyone. And um, at Clean Slate, thanks for setting this up, putting it together. And I'm looking forward to starting my evening. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for putting on a great show, Chris. I know Sam has dropped off. That was great to hear from him. A, a very unique spot out in San Francisco. Uh, thank you to all the IBMers that that helped pass this uh, this great event on. We look forward to putting on another one of these webinars in the future. And uh, as Angelica said, any questions, if you'd like to get your hands on uh, a, a deeper, uh, more in-depth, uh, customizable demo to your environment, let us know. If you want to have the 14-day trial, uh, please feel free. We're looking forward to to really seeing who who is uh, very interested in, in such a unique, innovative platform. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll be in touch soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris.